I had to drop my volunteer work at the crisis clinic in the spring of 1972. I was writing six days a week, and beyond that, I was getting stale, a little jaded on the phones. After a year and a half, I had heard the same problems too many times. I had problems of my own. My husband had moved out. We had filed for a divorce. I had two teenagers and two preteens at home who provided their own crisis for me to cope with. Ted graduated from the university in June. We had never seen each other outside the crisis clinic, and now we kept in touch with infrequent phone calls. I didn't see him again until December. My divorce was final on December 14th. On December 16th, all current and former clinic personnel were invited to a Christmas party, party at Bruce Cummins' home on the Lake Washington. I had a car, but no escort, and I knew Ted didn't have a car, so I called and asked him if he would like to attend the party with me. He seemed pleased, and I picked him up at the Rogers' roaming house on 12th N.E. Freda Rogers smiled at me and called up the stairs to Ted. On the long drive from the university district to the south end, we talked about what had happened in the intervening months since we had seen each other. Ted had spent the summer working as an intern in psychiatric counseling at Harborview, the huge county hospital complex. As a policewoman in 1950s, I had taken a number of mentally deranged subjects, two 20s and police lingo, to the fifth floor of Harborview and knew the facilities there well. But Ted talked little about his summer job. He was far more enthusiastic about his activities during the governor's campaign in the fall of 1972. He had been hired by the committee to re-elect Dan Evans, Washington's Republican governor. Former Governor Albert Rosalini had made a comeback try, and it had been Ted's assignment to travel around the state and monitor Rosalini's speeches, taping them for analysis by Evan's team. I just mingled with the crowds and nobody who I was, he explained. He enjoyed the masquerade, sometimes wearing a false mustache, sometimes looking like the college student he'd been only a short time before. He'd been amused at the way Rosalini modified his speeches easily for the wheat farmers of eastern Washington and the apple growers of Wenatchee. Rosalini was a consummate politician, the opposite of the upfront all American Evans. All this was heady stuff for Ted, to be on the inside of statewide campaign, to report to Governor Evans himself and his top aides with the tapes of Rosalini's speeches. On September 2nd, Ted, driving Governor Evans and other dignitaries in the lead limousine, had been the first man to traverse the North Cascades Highway that, wins, that winds through spectacular scenery at the northern boundaries of Washington State. They thought that President Nixon was going to show up, Ted recalled, and they had Secret Service men checking everybody out. His brother came instead, but I didn't care. I got to lead 15,000 people in a 64-mile parade across the mountains. The Evans campaign for re-election had been successful, and now Ted was in good standing with the administration in power. At the time of the Christmas party, he was employed by the City Seattle's Crime Prevention Advisory Commission and was reviewing the state's new hitchhiking law, a law which made thumbing a ride legal again. Put me down as being absolutely against hitchhiking, I said. I've written too many stories about female homo homicide victims who met their killers while they were hitchhiking. Although Ted was still looking forward to law school, he had his sights on the position as director of the Crime Prevention Advisory Commission was among the final candidates and felt optimistic about getting the job. We went our separate ways at the party. I danced with Ted once or twice and noticed that he seemed to be having a good time, talking with several women. He seemed to be completely entranced with a young woman who belonged to Seattle's Junior League, a crisis clinic volunteer whom neither of us had happened to meet before. Since some shifts never coincided, it wasn't unusual that volunteers passed and crossed. The woman was married to a young lawyer with a future, a man who is now one of Seattle's most successful attorneys. Ted didn't talk to her. In fact, he seemed in awe of her. But he pointed her out to me and asked about her. She was a beautiful woman with long, dark hair, straight and parted in the middle, dressed in a way that spoke of money and taste. She wore a black, long sleeve blouse, a straight white silk evening skirt, solid gold chains and earrings. 
I doubt that she was even aware of Ted's fascination with her, but I caught him staring at her several times during the evening. With the others at the party, he was expansive, relaxed, and usually the center of conversation. Since I was the driver, Ted drank a good deal during the evening. He was quite intoxicated when we left at 2 a.m. He was friendly, relaxed, drunk. He settled into the passenger seat and rambled on and on about the women at the party who impressed him so much. She's just what I've always wanted. She's perfect. But she didn't even notice me. And then he fell sound asleep. When I delivered Ted back to the Rogerses that night, he was almost comatose. It took me ten minutes of shaking him and shouting to wake him up. I walked him to the door and said good night, smiling as he bumbled in the door and disappeared. A week later, I received a Christmas card from Ted. The block print read, O. Oh, Henry wrote the gift of Magi, a story of two lovers who sacrificed for each other their greatest treasures. She cut her hair long to buy her lover a watch chain. He sold his watch to buy her combs for her hair. In acts they might seem foolish, these two people found the spirit of the Magi. It was my favorite Christmas story. How did he know? Inside, Ted printed his own wishes. The new year should be a good one for a talented, delightful, newly liberated woman. Thank you for the party. Love, Ted. I was touched by the gesture. It was typical of Ted Bundy. He knew I needed the emotional support of those sentiments. Seemingly, there wasn't a thing in the world I could do for him. He wasn't interested in me romantically. I was just about as poor as he was. Hardly influential. He sent that card simply because we were friends. When I look at that card today and compare it with the signatures on the dozens of letters I would receive later, I am struck with the difference. Never again would he sign with the jaunty flourish he did then. Ted didn't get the job as director of the Crime Prevention Adv Advisory Commission, and he resigned in January 1973. I saw him again on a rainy day in March. An old friend whom I'd known since my days in the police department, Joyce Johnson, a detective for 11 years in the sex crime unit and I emerged from the police jail elevator in the public safety building on our way to lunch, and there was Ted. Bearded now, he looked so different that I didn't recognize him at first. He called my name and, I, and grabbed my hand. I introduced him to Joyce, and he told me enthusiastically that he was working for the King County Law and Justice Planning Office. I'm going to, I'm doing a study on rape victims, he explained. If you could get me some back copies of the stories you've done on rape cases, it would help my research. I promised to go through my files and cull some of the accounts, many of them written about cases in which Joy Johnson had been the principal detective, and get them to him. But somehow, I never got around to it, and I eventually forgot that he wanted them. Ted had applied for the second time to the University of Utah's law school, largely at Meg's urging. Her father was a wealthy physician, her siblings professionals in Utah, and she had hoped that she and Ted would eventually end up in the Mormon state. He was quickly accepted, although he had been rejected in a previous application to the University of Utah in 1972, despite his degree from the University of Washington with distinction. Ted's grade point average from the university was 3.51, a GPA that any student might have aspired to, but his legal aptitude test scores had not been high enough to meet Utah's standards for entry. In 1973, he bombarded the admissions department at the Utah with letters of recommendation from professors and from Governor Dan Evans. Not content with the restrictions of a standard application form, he had resumes printed up listing his accomplishments since graduation from the University of Washington and wrote a six-page personal statement on his philosophies on law. It made an impressive packet. Under postgraduate employment, Ted listed Criminal Corrections Consultant, January 1973, currently retained by the King County Office of Law and Justice, planning to identify res recidivism rates for offenders who have been found guilty of misdemeanors and gross misdemeanors in the 12th County District Courts. The purpose of the study is to determine the nature and number of offenses committed subsequent to con conviction in District Court. 
Crime Commission Assistant Director, October 1972 to January 1973, as assistant to the director of Seattle Crime Prevention Commission, suggested and did the prime preliminary investigation for the commission's investigations into assaults against women and white-collar economic crime, wrote press releases, speeches, and newspaper articles for the commission, participated extensively in the planning of the commission's activities for 1973. Psychiatric counselor, June 1972 to September 1972 carried a full caseload of 12 clients during a four-month internship in Harborview Hospital's outpatient clinic, held periodic sessions with clients, entered progress reports and hospital charts, continually re-evaluated psychiatric diagnoses, and referred clients to physicians for medical and psychotherapeutic medication evaluations. Participated in numerous training sessions conducted by staff psychiatrists. Ted went on. I applied to law school because my professional and community activities demand daily a knowledge of the law I do not have. Whether I am studying the behavior of criminal offenders, examining bills before the legislator, advocating court reform, or contemplating the creation of my own corporation, I immediately become conscious of my limited understanding of the law. My lifestyle requires that I obtain a knowledge of the law and the ability to practice legal skills. I intend to be my own man. It's that simple. I could go on at great length to explain that the practice of law is a lifelong goal or that I do not have great expectations that a law degree is a guarantee of wealth and prestige. The important factor, however, is that law fulfills a functional need which my daily routine has forced me to recognize. I apply to law school because this institution will give me the tools to become a more effective actor in the social role I have defined for myself. T R B. Ted's personal statement was more erudite and filled with quotes from experts ranging from Freud to President Committees on Law Enforcement and the Administration of Justice Report. He began with a discussion of violence. You begin with the relation between might and right, and this is a surely proper starting point of our inquiry. But for the term might, I would substitute a tougher and more telling word. Violence. In right and violence, we have today an obvious antinomy. He had not softened his position against riots, student insurrections, and anarchy. The law was right. The rest was violence. Ted stated his current involvement in a series of studies, studies of jury trials using computer-coded data collected on 11,000 felony cases by the Washington State Criminal Justice Evaluation Project, I am writing programs designed to isolate what I hope to be tentative answers to questions regarding the management of felony cases. He talked of a study he had undertaken to equate the racial composition of a jury with its effect on the defendant. Ted's thoroughly impressive application to the University of Utah Law School in the early 1973 worked and overshadowed his mediocre law school aptitude test scores. But oddly, he chose not to enter their law school in the fall of 1973, and the reason given to the dean of admissions was a curious lie. He wrote, quote-unquote, with sincere regret a week before classes were to begin that he had been injured severely in an automobile automobile accident and was ho hospitalized. He explained that he had hoped that he would be physically strong enough to attend the fall quarter, but found he was not able to, apologizing for waiting so long to let the university know and saying he hoped that they would find someone to fill his place. In truth, Ted had been in an extremely minor accident, spraining his ankle, had not been hospitalized, and was in perfect condition. He had, however, wrecked Meg's car. Why he chose not to go to Utah in 1973 remains a mystery. There were discrepancies, too, in his almost flamboyant dossier. Both the study on rape that he had told me he was writing and the racial significance in jury composition study were only ideas. 
He had not actively begun work on either. Ted did begin law school in the fall of 1973 at the University of Puget Sound in his hometown Tacoma. He attended night classes on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, riding from the Rogers' roaming house to the UPS 26 miles south in a carpool with three other students. After the night classes, he often stopped for a few beers with his carpool members at the Creekwater Tavern. Ted May have elected to remain in Washington because he had been awarded a plum political job in April 1973 as assistant to Ross Davis, a chairman of the Washington State Republican Party. His $1,000 a month salary was more money than he had ever made. The perks that come with the job were something that a man who had struggled for money and recognition most of his life would revel in. The use of a select credit card issued to the Republican Party, attendance at meetings with the big boys, and occasional use of a flashy car. There were statewide travel, with all the expenses paid. Davis and his wife thought highly of Ted. He ate dinner with their family at least once a week and often babysat for their children. Davis recalls Ted as smart, aggressive, exceptionally so, and a believer in the system. Despite his work for the Republican Party, Ted managed to keep up a good grade point average in his night law classes at UPS. He continued to live at Freda and Ernest Rogers' home in the University District in Seattle. Ernest's health was no better, and when he had free time, Ted helped to keep the house in repair. There had been great upheavals, there had been great upheavals in Ted's life during 1973 but had seen him only once during that year, the brief meeting in the public safety building in March. It was that kind of friendship where you touch base with someone rarely. You were pleased to see each other, and they are, at least on the surface, the same people you have always known. I saw Ted again in December of 1973, again at a crisis clinic Christmas party. It was held at a board member's house in the... L'Oreal Hearst section in Seattle's North End, and this time, Ted brought Meg Anders with him, and I met her for the first time. In one of those crystalline flashes that float to the surface of a memory, I can recall standing in the hostess' kitchen, talking to Ted and Meg. Someone had placed a giant bowl of fried chicken wings on the counter. Ted munched on them as we talked. Ted had never described Meg to me. He had heard his detailed recollection of Stephanie Brooks' beauty, and I had seen his reaction to the tall, dark-haired woman at the last year's party. Meg was nothing like either of them. She seemed very small, very vulnerable, and her light brown hair overpowered her facial features. Clearly, she adored Ted, and she clung to him, too shy to mingle. I commented to Ted and I had attended the last crisis clinic Christmas Christmas party together, and her face lit up. Really? It was you? I nodded. I didn't have a date, and Ted didn't have a car, so we decided to pool our resources. Meg seemed vastly relieved. I was clearly no threat to her. A nice, middle-aged lady with a bunch of kids. I wondered then why he had let her agonize over it for a whole year, when he could easily have explained our friendship to her. I spent most of that evening talking with Meg because she seemed so intimidated by the mass of strangers milling around us. She was very intelligent and very nice, but her focus of attention was Ted. When he wandered off into the crowd, her eyes followed him. She was trying very hard to be casual, but for her, there was no one else there at all. I could understand her feelings only too well. Three months before, I had fallen in love with a man who wasn't free would never be free, and I could empathize with Meg's insecurity. Still, Ted had been with her for four years, and he seemed devoted to her and to Leanne. There seemed a good possibility that they might marry one day. Seeing Meg and Ted together, I assumed that he had given up his fantasy about Stephanie. I could not have been more wrong. Neither Meg nor I knew that Ted had just spent several days with Stephanie Brooks, that he was, in fact, engaged to Stephanie, and then he was looking forward to seeing her again within a week. Ted's life was so carefully compartmentalized that he was able to be one person with one woman and an entirely different man with another. He moved in many circles, and most of his friends and associates 
knew nothing of the other areas in his life. When I said goodbye to Ted and Meg in December 1973, I truly didn't expect to see him again. Our bond had been through the crisis clinic, and we were both moving away from that group. I had no way of knowing that Ted Bundy would one day change my life profoundly. It would be almost two years before I heard from Ted again, and when I did, it would be under circumstances that would shock me more than anything ever has, or possibly ever will again. Most of us have harbored a fantasy wherein we return to confront a lost first love, and in that reunion we have become better looking, thinner, richer, utterly desirable, so desirable that our lost love realizes instantly that he has made a terrible mistake. It seldom occurs in real life, but it is a fantasy that helps to relieve the pain of rejection. Ted had tried once, in 1969, to reach out to Stephanie Brooks to rekindle a seemingly extinguished flame, and it hadn't worked. But by the late summer of 1973, Ted Bundy had begun to be somebody. He had worked, planned, groomed himself to be the kind of man that he thought Stephanie wanted. Although his relationship with Meg Anders had been steady and, to Meg, a committed one for four years, Ted had no one but Stephanie on his mind when he arrived in Sacramento on a business trip for the Washington Republican Party. He contacted Stephanie in San Francisco, and she was amazed at the changes four years had wrought in him. Where he had been a boy, uncertain and wavering, with no foreseeable prospects, he was now urban, smooth, and confident. He was nearly 27, and he seemed to have become an imposing figure in political circles in Washington State. When they went out to dinner, she marveled at his new maturity, the deft manner with which he dealt with the waiter. It was a memorable evening, and when it was over, Stephanie agreed readily to make a trip soon to Seattle to visit him, to talk about the future it might hold for them. He did not mention Meg. He seemed as free to make a commitment as Stephanie was. Stephanie had flown to Seattle during her vacation in September, and Ted met her at the airport driving Ross Davis's car, and whisked her to the University Towers Hotel. He took her to dinner at the Davises' home. The Davises seemed to approve heartily of her, and she didn't demur when he had introduced her as his fiancée. Ted had arranged for a weekend in a condominium at Alpintal on Sinoclamy Pass, and still using Davis's car, he drove them to the Cascade Pass, up through the same mountain foothills they traversed when they'd gone on skiing trips in their college days. Looking at the luxurious accommodations, she wondered how he paid for it, but he explained that the condo belonged to a friend of a friend. It was an idyllic time. Ted was talking marriage seriously, and Stephanie was listening. She had fallen in love with him, a love that was much stronger than the feeling she had had for him in the college romance. She was confident that they would be married within the year. She would work to pay his way through law school. Back at the Davises' home, Stephanie and Ted posed for a picture together, smiling, their arms around each other, and then Mrs. Davis drove her to the airport for a flight to San Francisco as Ted had an important political meeting to attend. Stephanie flew back to Seattle in December 1973 and spent a few days with Ted in the apartment of a lawyer friend of his who was in Hawaii. Then she went farther north to Vancouver, B.C. to spend Christmas with friends. She was very happy. They would be together again for several days after Christmas, and she was sure they would, could firm up their wedding plans then. Ted then, even as he introduced me to Meg at that Christmas party in 1973, had apparently been marking time until Stephanie returned. During those last days of 1973, Ted whined and dined Stephanie royally. He took her to Tai Tung's, the Chinese restaurant in the International District, where they had eaten during their first courtship. He took her to Ruby Chow's, a posh oriental restaurant run by a Seattle City Councilwoman, telling her that Ruby was a good friend of his. But something had changed. Ted was evasive about marriage plans. He told her that he had become involved with another woman, a woman who had had an abortion because of him. That's over, but she calls every so often and just don't think it's going to work out for us. Stephanie was stunned. 
Ted told her he was trying to get loose of this other girl, a girl whose name he never mentioned, but that things were just too complicated. Where he had been so loving and affectionate, he now seemed cold and distant. They had such a little time to spend together, and yet he left her alone for an entire day while he worked on a project at school that she felt sure could have waited. He didn't buy her anything at all for Christmas, although he showed her an expensive chess set that he bought for his lawyer friend. She had brought him an expensive Indian print and bow tie, but he showed little enthusiasm for her gifts. His love-making, which had been ardent, had become prefunctuary, where what she had termed Mr. Cool performance, rather than a spontaneous show of passion. In fact, she felt he was no longer attracted to her at all. Stephanie wanted to talk about it, to talk about their plans, but Ted's conversation was a bitter diatribe about his family. He talked about his illegitimacy, stressing over and over that Johnny Bundy wasn't his father, wasn't very bright, and didn't make very much money. He seemed angry at his mother because she had never talked to him about his real father. He was scornful of what he called the lack of IQ of the whole Bundy clan. The only member of the extended family that he seemed to care about was his grandfather, Cowell. For the old man was dead, leaving Ted with no one. Something had happened to change Ted's whole attitude towards her. And Stephanie was a very confused and upset woman when she flew back to California on January 2nd, 1974. Ted had not even made love to her on their last night together. He had chased after her for six years. Now he seemed uninterested, almost hostile. She had thought they were engaged, and yet he had acted as if he could hardly wait to get rid of her. Back in California, she waited for a call, or a letter from him, something that might explain his radical change of heart. But there was nothing. Finally, she went to a counselor to try, try to sort out her feelings. I don't think he loves me. It seems as though he just stopped loving me. The counselor suggested that she write to Ted, and she did, saying that she had questions that had been unanswered. But Ted didn't answer that letter. In mid-February, Stephanie called Ted. She was angry and hurt, and she started to yell at him for dropping her without as much as an explanation. His voice was flat, calm, and he said, Stephanie, I have no idea what you mean. Stephanie heard the phone click, and the line went dead. At length, she concluded that Ted's high-powered courtship in the latter part of 1973 had been deliberately planned that he had waited all those years to be in a position where he could make her fall in love with him, just so that he could drop her, reject her, as she had rejected him. In September 1974, she wrote to a friend, I don't know what happened. He changed so completely. I escaped by the skin of my teeth. When I think of his cold and calculating manner, I shudder. She was never to have an explanation. She never heard from him again and married someone else at Christmas, 1974.